Linus Torvalds, he talks about Intel CPU meltdown and Spectre security problems and the lessons learned from it. Also, the NSA design spec algorithm that was just recently added to Linux kernel 4.17, the controversial spec algorithm. Well, the Linux team, they're going to remove that starting in kernel 4.20. And a few reasons why Linux gamers may want to pass on the upcoming NVIDIA RTX 20 series of video cards. Also, Zero Phone coming soon. It is a Raspberry Pi based phone that runs Linux and costs $50. New releases. Mastodon, Firefox, and Tails all saw new releases shipped this week. These are five stories that I will be taking into account. And the first story on the docket tonight is Linus Torvalds. He recently sat down and talked about the Intel CPU meltdown and Spectre security bugs and some of the lessons learned from those episodes in particular how Intel has learned some of the lessons from those episodes, and they're doing a better job of working with the open source community when the CPU security problems crop up from time to time. This article, written by Stephen Javon Nichols over at ZDNet, and of course, as always, I will link to all the articles in today's show in the show description. This article titled, Linus Torvalds Talks Frankly About Intel Security Bugs. Um... Recently, the Linux Foundation held a open source summit North America in Vancouver. Linus Torvalds was there, and he was asked, you know, a wide range of questions. But of course, a lot of questions uh, geared toward Linux security, and in particular, uh, the CPU uh, security bugs from Intel came up. And uh, Torvalds, reading a little bit from the Stephen J. Vaughn Nichols article here. Torvalds would really like his work to get back to being boring. It hasn't been lately because of Intel CPU meltdown and Spectre security bugs. The root cause behind these security holes was speculative execution. Now, in the article, uh, Stephen J. Vaughn Nichols, he tells you a little bit about what speculative execution is. Speculative execution is, quote, when a program does a calculation, which might go several ways, the processor assumes several results and works on them. If it's wrong, it goes back to the beginning and restarts with the correct data. Because CPUs are so fast these days, it's much quicker to do this than to have the hardware sit idle waiting for data. So uh, a very layman explanation of what speculative execution is. Linus Torvalds, he loves speculative execution, according to, uh, to this quote here, he says CPUs must do this, but Linus is annoyed that, quote, people didn't think about the problems of taking shortcuts with speculative execution. We knew speculative work that wasn't used had to be thrown away. So speculative ex- execution, CPUs must do that, but the work they do, the speculative work where they take guesses about which directions they should go with some of the data, that speculative work has to be thrown away. Otherwise, it's a security hole, right? The problem was that stuff wasn't thrown away. That problem is actually now baked into most modern processors. And really the long-term fix, according to this article here, is basically Intel has to create a new generation of Intel CPUs. Because it's an architectural problem, Intel basically needs to redesign their CPUs and come out with a new generation of chips. Anyway, uh, Linus Torvalds was a little bit ticked off you know, during this episode. Him and a lot of system developers and program, programmers were, were ticked off at Intel because they had to scramble to fix the hardware vendor's problems. Linus, in, in particular, said, quote, It's not fair. When we screw up, it's fair. We have to fix it. But it feels less fair when we have to fix someone else's problem. I couldn't agree with him more. Uh, if it's your problem, your security bug, right? You own it. You fix it. The kernel team, there are kernel security flaws that come up all the time. And the kernel team patches it, patches it very quickly, actually. And they do a great job, but Linus is right. They should not be uh, patching the kernel to fix other people's problems, these hardware vendor problems, such as Intel's recent problems with their CPUs. Uh, Also at the conference, uh, Greg Croa Hartman, he is the stable Linux kernel maintainer. He went into a little more detail about why fixing the first Spectre class bugs was such a problem for the Linux developers in particular. Uh, Reading a little further into the article, the problems were known about in July of 2017, Crower Hartman explained. So, Greg Crower Hartman here says, The meltdown and Spectre bugs, Intel knew about them in July of 2017. Think about this. But, quote, It wasn't until October 25th of last year that the kernel community heard rumors of the flaw. 
That's a long time, and we only heard rumors because another very large operating system vendor told Intel to get off their tails and tell us about it. So, the Linux kernel team did not find out about the flaw until three or four months after Intel knew that they had problems with their chips. So, Intel knew July 2017 about Meltdown Inspector. They didn't tell the kernel team. Well, actually, they didn't tell the kernel team at all. Someone let slip the rumor that Intel chips had these security flaws in October of 2017. Crower Hartman continues, when we get a kernel security bug, it goes to a Linux kernel security team. We drag in the right people. We work with the distributions, getting everyone on the same page and push out patches. So when the kernel team knows that there's a problem with their kernel, they get everybody in a room. They all work on it together. You know, a lot of different communities from a lot of different, you know, companies, a lot of different distributions. Crowell Hartman says, not this time. Intel siloed SUSE. They siloed Red Hat. They siloed Canonical. They never told Oracle, and they wouldn't let us talk to each other. So Intel knew that they had this, this flaw. They told SUSE, Red Hat, and Canonical, three very large corporations, Linux corporations. Uh, they, they let those corporations know, but for some reason, they would not tell Oracle. Also, uh, community uh, open source communities like Debian, Crowell Hartman said, were still, Debian wasn't allowed to be part of the disclosure. So most of the world was caught with their pants down, and that's not good. Now, what he means here, most of the world was caught with their pants down. Debian based, Debian and Debian based distributions probably account for 95% plus of all Linux desktop users. Uh, of course, Debian itself is also a very, very popular server Linux distribution. The fact that Intel never let the Debian community know about the security flaws ahead of time, they were never part of any uh, of what was going on as far as trying to get the patches. So Crowell Hartman said, uh, obviously, this was not a good thing to do. I completely agree. Uh, anyway, since then, Torvald says, Intel has gotten much better, but even now, I don't know what the hardware bug schedule is. Uh, Still, when the next Spectre variant showed up, Foreshadow, so they had Meltdown and Spectre, and then shortly after that, Foreshadow came around. The Linux kernel developers were notified ahead of time. So Intel, you know, they took a lot of heat for Meltdown and Spectre. So the next big security flaw, Foreshadow, uh, they went ahead and actually let the kernel team know, hey, we've got this problem. We need your help fixing it. Because of this, the Linux community could use their battle-tested open methods to patch this bug, according to Stephen J. Vaughn Nichols. Anyway, Torvalds, this is good news. The good news is the bugs have become more esoteric. They impact fewer and fewer cases, you know, some of the technical details. But probably the biggest news is what Greg Crow Hartman says here at the end of the article. We now have this wonderful back channel. We're talking to each other. We're fixing bugs for each other. Who would have thought even five years ago we'd see this? So Intel hopefully has learned lessons from Meltdown Inspector. Inspector. They seem like they're working a little bit better with the kernel team in particular, but with the open source community at large uh, a little more. So that is a good thing. And the second story on the docket tonight is the NSA design spec algorithm, the controversial spec algorithm that was just recently introduced to the Linux kernel in June in kernel 4.17. Uh, the Linux kernel team has announced that they're going to remove the spec algorithm from Linux kernel version 4.20, the upcoming 4.20 release of the kernel. From uh, this article over at Tom's Hardware, well, let's see who the author is, Lucian Armasu. Hope I got that name right. Anyway, the NSA design spec encryption algorithm will be removed from version 4.20 of the Linux kernel after just recently being added to the Linux kernel ver version 4.17 in June. The move comes after the International Standards Organization, the ISO, rejected two of NSA's cryptographic designs, Simon and Spec, on the basis of it not being trustworthy. So the problem with these, the, the spec algorithm that they've added to the kernel, the NSA created and, and somehow got added to the Linux kernel is no one really knows what it does. And the International Standards Organization, the ISO, rejected the NSA's cryptographic designs on the basis of it not being trustworthy. They, they don't really know what the NSA is doing with this. I mean, could it be some kind of backdoor? Who knows? It's all speculation. But anyway. Uh, the article goes on into how spec guide in, got into Linux in the first place. 
Uh, basically, even though the ISO rejected specs, the spec uh, months ago, before the Linux kernel 4.17 was finished, the algorithm still landed in the kernel due primarily to Google's backing. Yeah, okay, so Google basically is the reason that this ended up in the kernel. The company, Google, said it wanted to use the spec algorithm on Android Go devices that lacked AES encryption instructions, which come with newer ARM V8 chips. In developing markets, smartphone companies continue to sell sub-$100 phones with ARM V7 chips and no additional crypto processor, yada, 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 well, whatever that means. Anyway, Google is the reason this thing is in the kernel. Is it some kind of NSA backdoor? Who knows? But the fact that, you know, I, for one, own a Android device, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't like that being on my phone. I don't like it being in my kernel. Anyway, Google eventually chose to use the X -cha, cha algorithm for default storage encryption on lower-end Android smartphones because they found something else to use, something X -cha, cha in this case. Uh, they no longer really needed the spec algorithm for whatever reason they were using the spec algorithm so there's no reason really for it to be in the kernel because the only re uh, company re that really wanted that thing there anyway was google so why spec was rejected by the iso originally going a little deeper into the article both of the nsa design spec and simon algorithms were rejected by iso because the nsa refused to provide certain technical details about their designs or answer certain questions about them this is what ultimately led ISO to reject them as untrustworthy. The NSA won't tell you exactly what the algorithms do. So that's why the uh, ISO rejected them in the first place. Uh, I guess they, they, they told uh, the public a little bit about what they did, enough that Google found something that they thought they needed the spec algorithm for. But anyway... A little more in the article. This wouldn't be the first time the NSA has attempted to get software or hardware providers to include weakened or backdoored cryptographic algorithms in their products. In the 1990s, the NSA tried to get all device makers to adopt the Clipper chip, a crypto processor with a backdoor for the NSA, as well as force browser vendors and other software providers to use weak encryption protocols via export restrictions and other government rules. So, anyway, uh, it's kind of an old story now because, you know, starting with kernel 4.20, which should be out in a few weeks, um, the spec algorithm will no longer be in the kernel. Even if you are using kernels 4.17, 4.18, the upcoming 4.19 series, uh, the spec algorithm, if it is there, you can disable it. So it wasn't that big of a deal for those that are security and privacy minded. If you're worried about the spec algorithm, you can disable it if you have those older kernels. But hopefully, you know, starting kernel version 4.20, we don't have to worry about the spec algorithm anymore, what it may or may not be doing on your devices. And the third story on the docket tonight, a few reasons why Linux gamers may want to pass on the upcoming NVIDIA RTX 20 series of graphics cards. So over at Veronix.com, Michael Larabelle posted this article. 10 reasons Linux gamers may want to pass on the NVIDIA RTX 20 series. So he gives us 10 reasons. Michael Larabelle is the owner and creator of Veronix. You know, he does a lot of benchmarking as far as uh, hardware, in particular graphics cards, Pharonix.com, if you're not bookmarked to it, you probably should be. Great if you love, uh, of course, Linux content, but just hardware content, in particular hardware reviews and in particular hardware benchmarking. So, reading a little bit from the article, the most obvious reason some Linux users immediately write off NVIDIA, lack of open source driver support. So, that is a big negative with NVIDIA is the lack of open source driver support. Now, that is not specific to the upcoming uh, RTX 20 series of NVIDIA cards. This has been a long-standing problem with NVIDIA. It's the lack of open source driver support. Uh, Michael Larabelle goes on to write here, If you want to fully leverage the GeForce RTX 20 Turing hardware or even Maxwell and Pascal graphics cards, it's really only viable using closed source proprietary graphics drivers for maximum performance and features. There is no open source Turing support today, so the Turing line of, of cards, and even if it was, it would likely be plagued by the same Maxwell and Pascal limitations of no reclocking support. So you can't reclock your GPUs, your Maxwell and Pascal GPUs. You're also probably not going to be able to do that with Turing. Uh, anyway, basically the lack of open source uh, support 
open source driver support is a big negative for NVIDIA. One I hope they, uh, they, they address soon because Intel and AMD do so much of a better job as far as driver support because a lot of their drivers are open source. You know, Intel in particular, everything's baked into the kernel. AMD recently, you know, doing a lot more with their open source drivers. Uh, NVIDIA is kind of lagging behind and that, again, that's not geared mainly to just these new cards that are about to come out in a couple of weeks. That is overall the NVIDIA line of cards. We really need better open source drivers. Anyway, another reason Michael Larabelle mentions you may want to pass on these upcoming cards is these RTX cards. It will be a while before seeing RTX, which is ray tracing, ray tracing extensions, I believe, is what RTX stands for, uh, before you see games that utilize that technology. There are a number of Windows games forthcoming that will ship with NVIDIA RTX technology for ray tracing on new graphics cards, but nothing imminent coming to Linux. In fact, N NVIDIA has yet to publish their preliminary Vulkan ray tracing extensions. It will likely be a long while before seeing any RTX games native on Linux, or even for having Wine Steam Play working with any sort of RTX portability layer. So RTX is one of the main selling points for the Turing line of cards. If Since that's the big selling point for the card, and there's going to be no games for Linux that utilize the RTX technology, is it really worth it to rush out and buy these new cards when they first come out, when the price tags are going to be pretty high? Anyway, another reason, Turing appears to be fairly incremental upgrade outside of the RTX. So if you discount the RTX t technology, which really won't apply to us on Linux, there's really not much else to write home about on these cards. It's a minor, an incremental upgrade from, you know, the 10 series. You know, if you got a 1080, don't rush out and buy a 2080. Uh, it's not that big of an improvement, not for probably the money you're going to shell out for that thing, uh, Reading a little bit further into the article, the GeForce GTX 1080 series already runs very well with all current generation Linux games. So the, the 1080 series it is great. Uh, it's, it runs all current native Linux games with ease, unless going for something really demanding like uh, visuals at 4K. It's just been recently that the Rise of the Tomb Raider was released for Linux, while Windows gamers are already having the RTX-enabled Shadow of the Tomb Raider on the horizon. Anyway, some other reasons Michael Larabell mentions why you may want to pass on these cards. Poor Wayland support. Yeah, Wayland, you know, that's still a thorn in our side. When will Wayland finally be a mature project? Who knows? Uh, NVIDIA does not work well with Wayland. Uh, the Linux driver support for Turing is unclear, so even the proprietary drivers, uh, they may not be the greatest. Uh, the graphics cards are going to be incredibly expensive compared to their predecessors. So uh, the GeForce 2080 starts out at $799 US. <laughs> That's an expensive card, while the RTX 2080 Ti starts out at a whopping $1199 UX. Wow, wow. That's you, you could put a down payment on a house for what you're going to have to pay for the 2080 Ti, at least when it first comes out. Also, other reasons, uh, SLI. SLI doesn't work in Linux, really. It's worthless. No reason to, to do SLI in Linux. VR, still in rough shape on Linux. And the last reason he mentions why you may want to hold off on the RTX 20 series of cards is the Pascal series of cards. Their prices are going to drop when Turing becomes available. So if you've been wanting to buy that 1060, 1070, 1080, you know, the prices on those things should go down once you get the 20 series out. So uh, don't rush out. And probably you don't want to be one of these people that pre-orders this thing. Uh, if you're a Linux gamer, I mean, this is geared toward if you run Linux full time and you're buying this thing specifically for Linux gaming, it may not be worth it, at least not right away. And the fourth story on the docket tonight is coming soon. The Zero Phone. What is the Zero Phone? Well, this article over at Fossbytes, Zero Phone is coming soon. A Raspberry Pi Linux powered phone for just $50. Of course, I will link to the article in the show description. Reading a little bit. With data security and privacy becoming an alarming issue while dealing with the data-hungry companies, Xerophone seems like a sigh of relief. Xerophone is a Raspberry Pi-based open-source Linux-powered handset that has been launched as a project on CrowdSupply, which is a crowdfunding website. We've already told you about the phone in the past. 
false bytes, I guess, as covered zero phone in previous articles. The device promises no carrier, no carrier locks, no preloaded apps, and good riddance from harvesting of data without user knowledge. So the phone will be based on the Raspberry Pi Zero uh, with the ESP8266 Wi-Fi module and an Arduino microcontroller. What makes Zero Phone stand apart from uh, other conventionally available smartphones is the presence of a mini HDMI port and a full-size USB 2.0 port because it's, had, it's a Raspberry Pi. You do have the mini HDMI port. You have a USB 2.0 port. So really cool you know, options that you don't have on your standard smartphone. Apart from these, the phone would also feature a Wi-Fi connectivity option and a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. So some pretty cool stuff here. I hope this pans out again. This is a crowdfunding uh, project here over on Crowd Supply, which I found. I found the page for Zero Phone on Crowd Supply. I will also link to this. Anyway, fifty dollar open source smartphone based on the Raspberry Pi Zero. Says the project is coming soon. Sign up to receive updates and be notified when the project launches. Um, we do have an image here. <laughs> this is that's not much of a phone, but you know what? It is an interesting project nonetheless. Uh, again, they promise no carrier locks, no bloated apps, no data mining. It doesn't depend on big companies. Instead, it's open source hardware and software. It gives you as much control over your, your phone as possible. So this is really neat. One of the things I've been uh, saying for a long time, open source software just is exploding. We're on the uptick, right? Open source software is becoming mainstream. You know, like normal everyday people know what open source software is. We need to get hardware. We need to get open hardware, you know, to that level. And it's not, it's not even close to being to that level. So having a, a truly open device as a smartphone, is really appealing to somebody like me and I really like you know that it's no carrier locks no bloated applications already installed no data mining so get Facebook and all that crap off my phone some of that stuff you can't even get rid of on your your typical uh, vendor phones because they have these pre-installed apps that there's no way to uninstall uh, unless of course you root your phone and maybe install a different operating system on it anyway reading a little more from the crowd supply page a zero phone is user friendly. We'll have a typical feature of a phone. We'll have the typical features of a phone. But we'll give you advanced features when you need them. You can modify and repair it easily, and it's power user and programmer friendly. It's also built from widely available components, so you can build a zero phone independently if you need to. Because the thing is really just a Raspberry Pi with some other components added to it to make it a phone. Again, I. I you'll be able to build this thing. It's all going to be open hardware, right? So nothing's hidden. You know, the specs will be out there. You should be able to build your own Raspberry Pi Zero phone, if you wish. Uh, they did list what their features and specs, what I guess will be the features and specs, if this thing does come to fruition. Again, based on the Pi Zero, uh, has Wi-Fi, HDMI, full-size USB, 3.5 millimeter jack, 2 gigabyte GSM connectivity, 3G coming soon, uh, 128 by 64, 1.3 inch OLED screen. Uh, yeah, I didn't even think about the screen. What are they going to do for a screen? Huh. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Anyway, uses of extension ports, some, some information here. Uh, perfect for development. Runs Linux. Gives you root access. That's something you don't have on most phones, root access. SSH into it and use Linux software. I love SSH. So that, that's awesome. Attach a monitor, keyboard, mouse because it has the HDMI port. Why not? USB ports too for uh, keyboard and mouse. Use APIs for controlling the behavior of your Zero phone. Create the phone of your dreams. So this is an actually really cool project. Interesting. Not sure when this is actually going to launch over here at Crowd Supply. Uh, I might throw the guy behind this a few bucks because this interests me. I, I actually want one of these devices, again, if it ever comes to fruition. So, pretty neat project. And the fifth and final story on the docket tonight is I wanted to cover uh, some new releases of some pretty important programs out there. Uh, a couple of them that are really near and dear to my heart. Actually, all three of these I, I, I use... Uh, and I, I really love all three of these uh, free and open source projects. So the first is Mastodon. You guys know the last few months, you know, I deleted Facebook and Twitter from my lot, my life, my 
social media platform of choice has become Mastodon. Well, Mastodon 2.5 was just released. Mastodon version 2.5 is the 100th release of Mastodon since the project's inception almost two years ago. It brings a variety of improvements to the software, the full list of which is available in the change log. I'm not going to read the change log. But some of the highlights here, the public areas of the web interface have been redesigned. The color scheme and the design is now more consistent with the logged in interface. That is very cool. I've never liked, you know, when I log in, the Mastodon experience is so much different than when I'm not logged in, if that makes sense. If I, as a matter of fact, let me go to a web page here. If I go to, actually, if I go to my YouTube channel, and I will show you, uh, because I've got a link to, well, apparently YouTube is having some issues here. But if I go to my page here over at Mastodon.technology, this is me not being logged in. This is just my profile page. That looks nothing like Mastodon looks when I'm logged in and actually view, you know, my account. This is my Mastodon page here, you know. So hopefully... The experience will be a little more consistent on that. So the pub public areas of the web interface have been redesigned. Uh, but that's not all. The public pages now also display reply, favorite, boost buttons that open a remote interaction dialog that can take you back to your home server where you can actually interact with the toot from your account. So that's pretty cool. So you get this little uh, pop-up window, I guess this new window, you know, when you decide to reply, favorite, and boost. Uh, Anyway, uh, administration and moderation, they've uh, done some stuff with that. I'm not going to focus on that. Most of us do not administer our own Mastodon instances. Something I've thought about doing, but I probably won't end up doing. I don't have the time or the, the energy for that. It would be a massive undertaking to, to host my own instance of Mastodon. Anyway, uh, some new stuff with Federation Relays. Now, this is interesting. If your Mastodon server does not have enough activity to be interesting to new users, that chicken and the egg problem can now be solved by subscribing to a so-called Federation Relay. Federation Relays are separate servers that act as a, well, relay between participation, participating Mastodon servers. That is, every participating Mastodon server receives every public toot from every other participating server. So this is just a way to, you know, fill those timelines now, those local timelines, whatnot, on your Mastodon instance where you, you don't have any users right now, so it's empty. It's a ghost town. There's tumbleweeds rolling around in it. The Federation relays should help solve that problem. It's not something that they say you need to use long term. They discourage you from using Federation relays long term because that kind of goes against the core design of Mastodon where a server receives only toots from its users it follows. But, you know, again, because your instance is new, they understand that having an empty instance of Mastodon does not look good, so Federation Relays help with that problem. Also recently released, Firefox 62.0. First release, uh, first offered to release channels users on September 5th, 2018, so yesterday, 62.0 dropped. Uh, so what's interesting about Firefox 62, Firefox Home, the default new tab, now allows users to display up to four rows of top sites, pocket stories, and highlights, so you get uh, another row. That's great. That actually is a feature that interests me. I've always wanted a little more on that uh, default tab, uh, that uh, Firefox home tab. Anyway, uh, also reopen in container tab menu option appears for users with containers that lets them choose to reopen a tab in a different container. Not sure what they're doing with that. Uh, anyway, support for CSS shapes, CSS variable fonts, yada, yada, yada. Uh, you guys can read the release announcements. I will link to the Mastodon release announcement, the Firefox 62 release announcement, and also Tails 3.9 is out. The Tails operating system, Tails stands for the Amnesic Incognito Live System. Uh, basically, it is a way to anonymously surf the web. So Tails 3.9 is a very, very cool project. I've reviewed it a couple of times on the channel. Really love this particular Linux distribution. It's based on Debian. Uh, it uses the Tor browser to surf the web anonymous, anonymously for those that need that sort of functionality. Uh, 3.9, the biggest update of Tails this year. It includes two new features on which we have been working for more than a year. 
the additional software feature, and VeraCrypt integration. So the additional software feature, this is really awesome. You can now install additional software automatically when starting Tails. When installing an additional Debian package from Tails, you can decide to install it automatically every time you launch Tails. So Tails is a live system, right? Nothing is saved to a hard drive. That's the point. That is why it's secure. That's why it's private. But you can have, I guess, this persistence uh, option on Tails where it knows that every single time you launch Tails, you want to install this one or two programs that you use every time you use Tails. So that way it saves you, a, you know, a little bit of a headache having to constantly open up a terminal and sudo apt install whatever program you always install every time you use Tails. So pretty cool feature there. Uh, Veracrypt in integration, of course. That's a really nice feature. To unlock the Veracrypt volume in Tails, choose application, system tools, unlock Veracrypt volume, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so that was the two big features for Tails 3.9. And that was the fifth and final story for this episode, episode seven of Taking Into Account. As always, I like to end these Taking Into Account episodes with a viewer question or comment. So I received uh, this viewer comment here. This uh, actually it was a question I received via email. Uh, Hi, Derek. This is my second time writing you. Today, I would like to suggest a pretty interesting thing. As you probably know, there are some YouTube alternatives. I know that the reason you started out with this channel is that you wanted more people to know about Linux and stuff. There are certainly many people like this, but you also have a growing community of long-term followers who are into open source and would be glad if they could use DTube uh, or any of the YouTube alternatives instead of always having to use proprietary stuff. You can maybe consider uploading your videos to both. Bye, and thanks for your videos. Uh, I, I won't mention his name here because this was an email he sent me, uh, and I didn't mention that I would share this publicly. But this is a really interesting question. I get this question all the time. I'm a big proponent of the free software movement and the open source software movement. And, you know, why am I on YouTube? I'm on YouTube because... That's where everybody's at. If I want videos to actually get views and to share, you know, my knowledge of Linux and, you know, anything else I want to share. Plus, I want to spread awareness of Linux and free software and open source software. YouTube, by far, gets the most eyes on that content. Now, I do agree with him that it would be nice to use a, another YouTube alternative, maybe as a mirror. Uh, to have my content uploaded there. So those that choose not to view my content on YouTube can have a better alternative, maybe a freer alternative than YouTube. And I have actually been thinking about this for a few weeks now. Uh, the problem is the YouTube alternatives out there, he mentions DTube. Now that DTube is not DTube, DistroTube. There is a website called D.Tube. It is a YouTube alternative. Uh, I'm, I'm not convinced that that is really a viable alternative that anybody would be interested in that. BitChute is another YouTube alternative sometimes people mention. But I think the best alternative for me personally, something that would interest me, is me using PeerTube. And in particular, me hosting my own instance of PeerTube. Uh, for those that are not familiar with PeerTube, let me quickly do a search here for PeerTube. I did not spell that right in Google, but PeerTube. Uh, let me see if I can find an instance of PeerTube. Yeah, here's one. Here's one of the test instances of PeerTube. Again, it's kind of a, a YouTube alternative. I mean, you can upload videos. You can watch videos. Uh, you can even comment on videos. I don't think they have any kind of subscribe feature, but it is a really nice looking YouTube alternative. Uh, hasn't been around that long, still kind of young software, um, a bit immature, but fully functional. And I wouldn't mind trying my hand at hosting my own PeerTube uh, instance. The problem is the cost associated with that. If I host my own PeerTube instance, uh, storage would be a problem. I have already made on this channel, I've, I've been doing my channel now for almost 11 months now, and I've made like 300 and 10 videos in that 11 months and my video links I don't know what the average length is probably if you average it all out 
the average length of my video is probably somewhere around 20 minutes or longer. You know, that is a ton of video. Massive storage would be required if I just had to host the 310 videos I've already made, not to mention the potentially hundreds more or thousands more videos I may make in the months and years to come. So hosting my own PeerTube instance, I, I want to do it. I think it'd be kind of expensive. Uh, also, installing PeerTube, uh, reading a little bit from the PeerTube GitHub hub page, installing this thing is not very straightforward at all. It's going to you know, require some real effort. It's all done in the command line. Uh, you know, it's not a very user-friendly uh, in install it's not like setting up something like WordPress or Joomla or you know anything like that uh, it's a little bit deeper involved than that I may j actually have to hire a freelancer <laughs> actually to set up my PeerTube instance but it does interest me I actually have a pretty good domain name that I've registered for again a, a future instance of PeerTube for me I've uh, registered the, do the domain name distro.tube I think that's a great PeerTube name. So we may do that in the future. Again, uh, it's, there's going to be some money involved in it. That's kind of what's holding me back. I'll, also, I'm not sure if I can get the thing installed myself. I may have to, again, hire somebody that's a little more experienced at setting stuff like this up for me. But I think that will be the way I end up going. I do want to thank the, uh, the user that submitted that question to me. So I, I really appreciate that. And that is this week's Taking Into Account Episode 7. Before I go, I do want to give a special thanks to all my patrons. Of course, I'm talking about A.K. Allen, Alex, Hanson, Tony, Bart, Benjamin, Ben, Bill, Bruno, Brian, Carlos, Christian, Chuck, Dan, the other Dan, Daniel, David, the other David, Dirk, Eduardo, Francisco, Greg, Humade, Interceptor, Jake, John, Carl, Katrina, Keith, Leo, Marcus, the other Marcus, Mateo, Mark, Martin, Matthias, Michael, Mr. GFY, Mr. Smarty Pants, Mr. Nilly Bops, Paul, Rob, Robert, Ron, Silvio, First Stephen, Second Stephen, Third Stephen, Swami, Tiedemann, Voice Live to Bella, and John, you guys rock. You guys help make this show possible. Peace, guys.